question for you this morning. Do you have others in your life? Let me, let me explain. So maybe this morning the best way to explain is there is this little game going on later today. A- anybody aware? Andy Bach, I know you're aware. He's a good Kansas City Chief fan up there. Yes. Uh, a couple other Kansas City fans. Any, any Kansas City Chief fans other than Andy and Jim? So there must be Taylor Swift fans as well, uh, Linda. That's good. Uh, do any 49er fans today? Uh, so if you're a true Steeler fan, you can't be a 49er fan today because you don't want to see them win their sixth Super Bowl and tie us with the amount of Super You see how petty we are around here? But, but maybe the Super Bowl for you, maybe not this year, but the Super, maybe NFL football, maybe some reality presents people in your lives who don't think like you do. Who are others in our life. You know what I mean? Maybe someone uh, that God has placed in your life that is not like you would be another. Yet you find your lives intertwined in some way. And maybe it's someone not so close. Maybe someone that you keep your distance from. That you might even have some angst with that doesn't think like you do, might belong to a people group that you disagree with, (laughs) a political party that's not yours, an ethnicity that doesn't look like you, a sexuality that doesn't have the same base that you do, a religion that doesn't quite fit what you believe. Are Are you tracking with me? And if you're honest, you proverbially run when you see them coming. In fact, you might even talk about them in a not so kindly manner, I do have Facebook. Do you have, do you have any others in your life? Yeah, we're, we're getting real today. You ready to get real? You know that sometimes I just like to dump in the, the deep end and, and get real. And, it, 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 and I get real in that subject, the subject of others this morning, because our text gets real with regard to the issue of others this morning. And and I I have this to share with you, maybe warn you against the reality of this text and of the scripture does not allow us to have angst with others, but calls us to love them. In fact, God makes it pretty clear through this story today that we're to learn to love those people in our lives that are not like us. And to do so, listen, for the gospel of Jesus. We've been talking about transformation in our lives in the chapters of 9 through 12 of the, of the book of Acts. And I'm trusting that today, as we look at a radical transformation in a guy by the name of Peter, that we too might be prepared to make some changes in our lives. So in order to do so, let's turn to the scriptures, to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 23. If you have your Bibles this morning, that's awesome. You can turn there. If not, in your pew Bibles, in your pews, there are Bibles. It's page 918 in your pew Bibles. Uh, If you want to cheat with your electronic devices, you can, right? Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 23. As you turn there, uh, some important pieces to remember, right? We always like to go back and catch up where we've been so that we know where we're going. That God, God loves, a couple pieces, God loves to orchestrate, right, throughout the scriptures, crazy and cool scenarios, as well as in our own lives, to help us in our transformation. That we are a work in progress, that your pastor is a work in progress, transforming, and God loves to orchestrate crazy and cool scenarios not only in the pages of scripture, but in our lives to help us with that. And that while God clearly has called out in the scriptures uh, the people of Israel as his in the Old Testament, you follow me, right? If you've been here, you've heard this before, right? The reality that in the Old Testament, that there is an elect, a chosen nation uh, of Israel that God calls out as his. That though he has clearly done that, he also clearly indicates throughout the Bible that he intends to call out people of every tribe, of every tongue, and every nation as his before 
the return of Jesus. And last week we called it the cosmic change that God is doing in this section of book of Acts is, is to make it known that the reality of all that God had said with regard to calling all nations, all children, all family to himself, he is doing in this very section of scripture. Last week we looked at that cosmic change from the Old Testament and let it reflect on where we were in Acts chapter 10. This morning, just to give you a full picture of the scripture, let's go all the way to the book of Revelation, right, to a time that has not yet come, and let that reflect back to chapter 10 of Acts as well, specifically Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And so John is in the heavenlies, right? He's getting a picture of what heaven is like, and what he says heaven is like is this. He says, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from one nation, from one tribe, and one people group. Is that what it says? Thank you. No. <laughs> he's calling a great multitude. He sees a multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. And they were all standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they were crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Do you hear it? The reality of all nations represented in that group, all people groups, all realities of his people called out to be his. So you see it from, from Genesis to Revelation, the reality is, is that God, uh, his ultimate aim, his ultimate goal, and this is good news for us who are non-Jews, right? The reality is, is that he's calling all people. And in Acts 10, the Bible gives us a, a micro story, a small story of that macro story in a meeting between two people. Last week we looked at Cornelius. This week we look at Peter. Remember Cornelius last week? He was an other. <laughs> he was a Roman centurion. He didn't belong in this picture, right? And yet God is leading him into a saving relationship through Jesus. Peter, though, is the chosen one, right? He's the Jew. But Peter's having a hard time loving the others. But... As much as God is doing a conversion story in Cornelius, he's doing a transformation story in Peter. And that's where we pick up this morning. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 23. To make sure you're still awake and that you are there in Acts chapter 10, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Very good. Listen to the very word of God. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. The next day, so the... Folks from Cornelius' tribe, right, are headed to Joppa. And the next day, as they, that, that group from uh, Caesarea, were on their journey and approaching the city of Joppa, Peter, here we are, went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry because it was lunchtime. And he wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and he saw the heavens Opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, oh, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean do not call common, Peter. And this happened three times. And the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men, uh, just by chance, who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. And they called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. 
what's the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he, Peter, invited them, the others, in to be his guests. Ah, may God help us in the understanding of his word. Let's start with what might be obvious to us, but needs to be obvious to us all, is that Peter is stuck in some regards in his life. Peter is a work in progress. Peter is in the midst of some transformation. Can you, can you see that Peter here is not the glowing example of a follower of Christ in this story? Right? Where does he get stuck? Well, there's two places that I think we can see that he gets stuck. The first is in his religiosity. Say that, religiosity. I don't even know if it's a word, but... If it isn't, it should be. And his religiosity, this is where we often go as we think about this text. Peter is confronted on a couple of levels with regard to the Jewish law. First, is that he shouldn't eat certain kinds of animals, right? And all animals require a certain process of preparation, which the vision that he has defies both. I, I will say, much to the delight of those who love sausage and bacon, right? And there are some that would make this text about the fact that we can eat sausage and bacon. I'm just here to tell you that's not what this text is about. But if you were at men's breakfast yesterday, we enjoyed some sausage and bacon. So listen, to Peter's credit, he he knew Leviticus 11. Do you know what Leviticus 11 says? There's all kinds of dietary laws in that, all things that the Jews should abide by. And, and, and Peter says, I've been committed to following that diet way better than Stoffer has been committed to his diet, as you can tell. But, listen, what he misses is that the law is not the order to be followed as much as following God. Did you hear that? That the law is not the order to be followed as much as following God. God God made the law for the good of his people. The law is good. It should be followed. But we need the flexibility to hear when God is being flexible for his purposes. Because often, God's law can become a man law that is way beyond what God intended. In fact, Jesus, while he ministered in the presence of Peter had a conversation with him and the other disciples in Mark chapter 7, where, where Jesus has already begun to work on these dietary laws. Jesus emphasizes with the disciples that the heart of a follower of Jesus is more important than food restrictions. He says, whatever comes out of a man is way more important than what's going in. In fact, even in Mark 7, Jesus declares to the disciples, listen, let's just say it now, All foods are clean. But Peter didn't get it then. And he hasn't got it here. The voice of the Lord comes in this vision and says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. To which Peter is unwilling to do because of the law, because of his religiosity. Even more, we can see what the Lord is doing here that goes way beyond dietary restrictions. And this is actually the point. The the Lord is preparing him, Peter, for what might be an even harder pill to swallow. You ready for this? And that is that he can associate with others. That he can associate with the unclean Gentiles of the world. Because, again, the law clearly states, right? Right? The Jews, you're, you're, you're not to go in and have fellowship with the Gentiles. Oh, that's about to be challenged. In fact, and here's the stunning truth of all this. God is declaring to Peter that all people, <laughs> all nations are acceptable to the king and are welcome to the gospel. 
But here, hear it, Peter is stuck partially because all of his life, his religiosity enforced the law over the spirit of the law that caused him in this case to miss the voice of God. But I think there's more to this than just his religiosity. He, he's also a bit stuck in his personality. He's also a bit stuck in his personality. Let's just think about Peter for a second. Do you remember the story when Jesus calls Peter to be a disciple? Uh, Jesus has taught from Peter's boat. And when he's done teaching, he says to Peter, hey, cast the boat out. Let's go fishing. Well, number one, this isn't the time of day, Jesus, to go fishing. And and what Peter literally says at that point is like, we fished all night, which is the best time to fish, and we caught nothing. Jesus, there ain't no way you're going to catch fish. That, that's Peter's response. You hear his personality? Jesus just gave this amazing sermon, and he's going, eh, no, I'm the fisherman, you're the teacher, we shouldn't do this, right? Uh, Peter, to make sure that you know the end of that story, finally succumbs, he goes out, and they couldn't pull the nets in because there was what, so many fish. But you hear his first response? Uh, it, it's like a first response that he has later in life, that, that when Jesus comes to him and says, hey, who do people say that I am? And the disciples are spouting a number of things off. And, and, then, and then Jesus asks this question of his disciples, who do you say that I am? And listen, Peter knocks it out of the park. He says, Jesus, you are the Christ. And he says, you're right, Peter. On you, I'm going to build my church. But then Jesus continues to teach, and he goes, but you need to know this, and there's going to be a time that's going to come, and, and there's going to be enemies of mine that come to, to persecute me, to kill me, and, 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 I, and I'm going to die. And Peter's like, oh, Jesus. Come here. And he pulls him aside, and he begins to whisper to him, listen, you need th this whole death stuff, that's not helping your cause, dude. We need to be inspiring, right? Let's not talk about the death stuff. Let's talk about the life stuff, right? I just got the answer right. Why don't we go with that? You are the Christ, right? You're the one we've been waiting for. And he's going, get behind me, Satan. Whoa. Are you getting a sense of Peter's personality? How about the time in John 13 when Jesus is washing the disciples' feet and he's going around washing all the disciples' feet and he comes to Peter and Peter says, I'm not taking my socks off for you. You ain't washing my feet, right? No way you, Jesus, are washing my... It was kind of a humble thing, but sort of a prideful thing. And Jesus tells Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then <laughs> Peter goes, well, then wash me all, right? You see Peter's personality? Not far after that circumstance, remember Jesus is saying, okay, it's time, I'm going to go die. And oh, by the way, most of you are going to run like crazy. Peter goes, <laughs> I'm not running. And literally in hours, not once, not twice, but three times, Peter denies Christ. Here's what I would call Peter reluctant, right? Reluctant. Reluctant obedience, but reluctance. To which we want to say, well, well, certainly this part of Peter has been sanctified, right? All those illustrations, Pastor Rick, are before the resurrection. I mean, look at him now. Peter's preaching at Pentecost. Thousands of people are coming to Christ. Look at him healing in Jerusalem. Certainly this is the new Peter. Well, is it? Look again at Acts chapter 10. It appears that while all this post-resurrection stuff is true, that Peter truly is an amazing guy, that there is a lingering hard spot in Peter's heart with regard to people who are not like him. And it has to do with a reluctance to accept them, the Gentiles or the non-Jews. Did you see it in verses 13 through 15 of our text the Lord speaks, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter says, okay. No, he says, by no means, Lord. Then the Lord says, well, let me give you some more explanation. What God has made clean, Peter, you're not to call common. And he goes, oh, okay, I get it now. No, listen, how many times does it happen? It seems to be a common thread with Peter's life. 
three times that conversation happens. Rise, kill, and eat. No. Listen, you shouldn't call it uncommon. No, I still not getting this. Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. No. Right? You, you get it? Three times it happens. And in verse 17, Peter really gets it, right? No, it says in verse 17 that he's still inwardly perplexed. Reluctant. Hey, even to the point that the Lord tells him when the visitors come, go with them without hesitation. And when they come, Peter goes, why have you come again? <laughs> you just hear it in his personality. Reluctant. And we say, oh, Peter. And it would be easy to be frustrated with Peter at least for me, if I wasn't so much like him. <laughs> right? Stuck on what I think a godly person should look like, according to my rules and standards. Stuck on a, a personality that is reluctant to obey in the things that are not as I want them to be. I don't know. Maybe you've been there too. Maybe for you, it's even an inability to love the others of your life. Well, the sermon series is on transformation. So we got to ask the question, how do we change? Well, let's look at Peter through a bit of a different lens in this story. We see his stuckness, don't we? But do you see that he eventually gets there? That he gets to obedience? How does he do that? How is it that Peter is changing? Well, I think we can see three things in Peter's life quickly that help him in his process. They're not revolutionary things. In fact, they're things that you might expect to hear in church. Are you ready? Three things. Pray, listen to God, and obey. <laughs> right? You're going, oh, man. I got that like in first grade Sunday school. Well, as soon as you start to do it really well, I'll stop preaching it. Or maybe God will stop sharing it. See here that Peter is praying that there is something radical and life-giving to religious convictions. You hear me? Not all religiosity is bad. There, there is something life-giving for Peter and his commitment to be in prayer. And there he is at noon. Remember, remember a couple things. That Peter's in the midst of a movement that is seeing the story of Jesus changing lives. And Peter's like pretty much at the center of it. You think he's a little busy? Do you think that a lot of people are calling on him? Do you think that he's tired? Do you think he's filled with stress? Yeah, he's all of those things. So that is why he prays. Also remember this, like that people are out for his life. He's already been arrested twice. I'm sure he's been threatened with his life. I'm sure the reality that he knows that there are people outside his door in Joppa that would love to see him go down. So, so here the reality of the, the fervency of wanting to hear from God. That one of the constants in his life is that at prayer times, he is convinced that he needs to be on his face before God to gain sustenance and to get guidance. And in the sixth hour, he is praying. He's praying even though he's starving. He's praying. And listen, it's not God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our Jewish food. Right? It's not what it is. He's on his face, earnestly seeking the presence of God. Peter's praying. But also hear that Peter is listening. He's listening for the word of God. The, the place of prayer for Peter is certainly a place that he has received sustenance and guidance before. And though the text does not say it directly, I think we can see that Peter has gone to prayer in order to hear from God. Because it is in prayer that he has heard from God. And so here we are again. And the vision as a vision does not seem to be something new to Peter. It's as if he's had these kinds of things before. He's not taken back that he has heard from God. <laughs> he just doesn't like what it is that God is saying. Maybe you've been there. 
Again, this moment's not perfunctory. It, it, it's not an obligation. Peter believes that God speaks, and Peter has placed himself in a position to actually hear from God. And, and listen, to some degree, I, I even like that Peter is dialoguing with the Lord. It, 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 hear this out. I, I've told a number of you this in, in, in individual circumstances. The reality is this. I, I don't know about you. Have you ever been mad at God? It's church. Am I allowed to admit that? Yes, it's okay to be mad at God. Listen, everybody in the Bible at some point has been mad with God that hasn't liked what he heard. It's not suck it up buttercup moment, right? Peter doesn't just suck it up. But he, he starts dialoguing. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. By no means, God. Like, I've lived all my life not eating that stuff. I'm not starting now. You're going to have to do better than that. He's dialoguing with them. And then the Lord says, oh, but it's all going to be good. Don't worry. I've taken care of it. Ah, you're going to have to tell me that again. And maybe a third time to be sure. He's dialoguing. He's in a relationship with God. God, listen, we need to surrender to the authority of who God is, but he so desperately wants to hear our response because it's in our response that he'll even deepen the relationship. So get the process. Peter is praying. Peter's listening. He's even dialoguing. But then finally in this text, Peter is obeying. Yeah, it's reluctant at first, but he's still working at it. He, he does, at the end of this text, go to the door, right? Though he doesn't go without hesitation, he goes. And what does he do that maybe surprises the readers? Certainly surprised those around him that day. He lets the Gentiles in. That little thing in verse 23, it just seems like a little thing like, yeah, if somebody's knocking on my door, I'd let them in. But this is huge for Peter. First of all, think, think about the context of this. Peter's been in prison twice. And who's dragged him there? Romans. <laughs> so listen, Peter's hanging out at Simon the Tanner's house. Oh, nobody knows that I'm here. He's like secretly in, in hideaway, right? And then all of a sudden, it, it, interrupting prayer time with a crazy vision about animals that I shouldn't eat, all of a sudden he hears, hey, is there a Peter here? And he recognizes the voice. It's a Roman soldier. What's the first thing in Peter's mind? Oh, God, I'm going to prison again. What'd they find this time? But here what Peter does, uh, with some hesitation, he goes to the door. Listen, we have a great perspective. We know what's going on. Man, God showed up to, the, to Cornelius. He sent his guys. This is going to be really good. We've even heard this story many times. We know that there's like this massive revival at the end of the story. Peter doesn't know that. He knows he's hanging out on a rooftop, praying at noon, and he hears a Roman soldier calling his name. I don't know about you. I would have found some hay bales or something, right, and hid behind them. But Peter hears from God. And God says, just go to the door. Just go to the door. Do you hear the simplicity of that? I mean, before it was rise, kill, and eat, and he's going, ah, I can't do that. Okay, well then just go to the door. Okay, I can go to the door. M maybe you're going to do some major prison break thing again. <laughs> I can do that, right? I, I, I like seeing you work these things out. I, I'm just going to go to the door. So he goes to the door, and he asks, why do you want me? And here's the deal. These three Romans say to him, well, our dude Cornelius, who's in Caesarea, right, is calling right now. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, uh, our, dude's, our, our dude Cornelius, right, uh, he saw a vision from whom? From God that said that we're to come get you and you're to speak at Cornelius' house. And 
Peter knows. Now a bit more of what we know. And that is God is orchestrating something beautiful. But it's going to take something radical in the transformation of his life to do it. And you know where he starts? He just says, ah, come on in. I know, I, I know it defies everything in my Jewish law book. But come on in. Let's eat together. You can stay here for the night. Maybe God has some work yet to do in me. My good friends and people that I love to spend time with in the challenges of addiction and recovery have this great saying. It's this, just do the next right thing. See, Peter didn't get, I mean, I think, I think God would have loved to give him the big picture, like you're going to be the guy, right, that goes to the Gentiles, and this is going to be, and Peter's like, no, I, I can't take all that. Okay, well, then just do the next right thing. Go to the door. Just go to the door, Peter. Okay, I, I can do that. I can go to the door. And when he's at the door, he gets a glimpse of the things of God, and then he does the next right thing. <laughs> Come on in. Let's dine together. You can stay here for the night. It's not an all at once surrender to everything. It is an obedience that happens one step at a time. So hear me, Peter's changing, right? Sunday school answers, right? Peter's changing because he's praying, he's listening, and he's obeying. And I just finished this morning by asking us this question, and I mean us. How is it that will change? How is it that will change? Maybe first we need to ask ourselves this morning, where is it that I'm stuck? <laughs> Maybe it's in a decision that you might be trying to make. Maybe it's in a repetitive sin that you can't seem to shake. It might be a place of inflexibility of religion or personality. All of those are places that we get stuck. But can I stay faithful even to this text this morning and ask again, are there others in your life that God is challenging you to love, that God is challenging you to accept, that God is challenging you to just go to the door even as Peter was challenged? Because I don't know if you realize this or not. If not, keep your eyes open this year in an election year. But we live in a polarizing place. Right? You're either on this side or that side, and God forbid that the two sides should talk. Because if you're not with me, then you must be against me. If you're not on my team, then you're on the other team. And all of a sudden, we have others in our lives. And, and, and Jesus beautifully gives us a summary of this whole book. Not that you shouldn't read it, but here's the summary. You should love God, and you should love Others. <laughs> there it is. It's a summary of the whole book. Love God and love others. I, uh, no room for polarization. Look, there's room for disagreement. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, right? Okay. I'm not asking how to agree. But I am saying that this book says that even when I disagree, I'm to love. It's a lesson that he's teaching Peter. I don't know, over dinner, he might have quoted Leviticus 11 to them. I, I, I disagree with y'all. But God told me to love you. Maybe that's a challenge. Maybe that's a challenge for you. And I think it's a challenge that God gives us because I believe that the spread of the gospel is dependent on it. People of God, we cannot get stuck only loving those who are like us. The power of the gospel is loving those who are not like us so that we would have the hope of sharing Jesus. So maybe ask yourself, where is it that I'm stuck? But then secondly, 
say, how do I change? And then here are the three points. Pray, seek the face of God, seek to take on the fullness of Christ. Ask God, where is it that, that I'm stuck? How is it that you need me to change for my part in furthering the gospel? Pray, then listen. It might be a vision or a dream, probably not, but I have good news. We are less dependent on visions and dreams because we actually have the word of God in the scriptures. Crazy fact. The Bible truly is sufficient for training us in all things. In fact, Paul instructs a young Timothy that, that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. Yeah, even for rebuking and certainly for correcting. But all things to train us for righteousness. I like that, amen. The Bible has a lot of great information in it, but hear this, it is not primarily a book to fill your brain with information. It is the living word of God to bring transformation in my life and in yours. And we need to listen to it. And then, <laughs> ready? Obey it. Listen, not all at once. We're not going to get it all right. That's a little overwhelming. But, but like Peter, we need to start dialoguing with God. Allow him to lead us to the next right thing. Maybe this is an honest conversation with God. God, I know you've called me to love this person. But I honestly don't know how. <laughs> and God says, well, let's start by not resenting them anymore. <laughs> Let's start by not putting them on a different team as yours. And maybe that starts even by just praying for them. I really don't know what God will do when you actually start desiring to change, but I do know this. He will do something to change us only when we seek to be changed. And it will be through simple change. When, when, when Peter was left perplexed, God told him to just go to the door. And when he did, as we'll see next week, God starts an amazing change for more than Peter. Even more than the church at Joppa. But for the whole world. So people of God, may it be when obedience seems perplexing, just go to the door. <laughs> that we just do the next right thing. And recognize we are stuck. Recognize that what he calls us to, to change, is the things that we already knew. Pray. Listen. Listen. And obey. It's the story of Peter. It should be our story as well.